Hey everybody, what is happening? I hope you are having a great day wherever you are in the part of the world out there. You know, we have listeners in 130 countries, which is pretty cool. Now, look, um, number one, I'm trying to get more. I have so much going on right now. I'm trying to get more on track with getting these episodes out on time. Uh, and I'm, I look, I want to tell you guys, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I've been busy and we've been a little bit running late. And I know that's uh, it's messing with our download numbers a little bit. So I want to get back on track. Now, today's episode, um, uh, I was really looking forward to it. Now, I got to tell you, the today's guest um, was the head of the FBI's hostage negotiation unit for like 20 years, okay? This was the guy. He, he has uh, done like plane hijackings. He was involved with Waco. Like he's been involved with some very, very high level stuff. Now I brought him on because what I wanted to get at is, you know, look, we all at one point, right? We, we're, we're salespeople, we're sales folks. Um, you know, we get somebody into uh, a meeting, a table, you know, we have to number one, pitch ourselves. And uh, you want to go listen to Oren Claff's episode for for how to pitch. And then, you know, once you do your pitch and you're involved in a deal, um, you know, you have to negotiate stuff, right? Whether that's price, whether that's commission, um, you're always negotiating, always, right? Whether that's with your wife, your kids, your neighbor, whatever, you're always negotiating. So what I wanted to get from the today's guest is, you know, I really wanted to learn how to one sit down and take control of a situation, right? How do I take control and how do I win every single time? Now, unfortunately, um, you, you know, some of the Jedi mind tricks that I was hoping to learn from today's guest, I didn't quite get what I wanted, but that's okay. I mean, I, I think this episode is, is certainly valuable. Um, so, so anyhow, look, I typically give you a rundown. I'm not going to. I'm just going to let you get to it. Uh, Let me know what you think. Um, On Twitter, I'm at SuperAgentsLive. Hashtag for the show is unpack that idea. Um, And, uh, you know, I'd love to, to, uh, to hear from you on Twitter. And two, I would love to get a review out on iTunes. Let's get it. Welcome to Super Agents Live. This is the one place where you can come and hear the most successful people in real estate. You'll hear how these super agents built their businesses, how they stay productive, and how they stay motivated. Who am I? My name's Toby Salgado, and I made my first million in real estate. And I'm your host for the next 30 minutes while we talk to yet another amazing real estate entrepreneur. Stay tuned. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. All right, before we get there, um, just a little bit of housekeeping. I already told you guys our Twitter handle. Um, I want to share with you guys two things that we are currently developing. Um, Wait, let me back up for a second. You know, part of what we want to do in the show is talk about vendors that you should use and obviously ones that you should not use. So uh, one of the things we're working on three things. Okay. One of the things we're working on, I'm working on a new page called Toby's tools. Um, and that is going to be, um, that is going to be uh, a list of, of vendors that, that, you know, that I trust that I endorse stuff that you should use. And hopefully, you know, wh- what I'm going to do for those guys, if they want to be on that page, you know, and obviously I'm going to, they're going to be white labeled. I'm going to trust them. Uh, they need to give you some kind of deal. So it's not going to be, you know, these folks cannot pay to get on the page. Uh, They have to earn their way in it. So so number one, Toby's tools. Um, If you guys have a tool out there that you that you love and uh, you'd love us to check it out, um, send me an email. Uh, I'd love to. I want to I want to I want that page to be super, super valuable. Okay, so that's the first one we have our developers doing. I'm still trying to put together the list. The second thing that uh, that I'm pretty excited about building for you guys is, is and I don't have a name for it yet, but it's fundamentally going to be like a backstage pass, right? So right now, you guys tune in after the fact of me recording this episode, and you just listen to me talk with the guy. Now, I, you know, I've heard from you guys that, that uh, a lot of the questions I ask are ones that you had anyway, but I'm sure I don't always do that. Uh, you know, we're all at different stages of growth, and we, you know, whether personally or business. So what I want to do is uh, create a product where you guys 
Um, it, this is obviously, a pay, I don't sell you guys anything else. This is obviously a paid product, um, but a product where you guys can join the call and not only listen live, but interact. Um, so so you, if you have a question about, you know, what you should do, uh, you know, a problem that you're currently facing, you can ask me and my guest. Uh, so it's going to be kind of like it's going to be in a lot of ways live group coaching. Um, so, you know, and I'm going to I've already talked with a lot of folks, you know, guys like Bob Corcoran, uh, a lot of high level folks are interested in uh, in helping out. So stay tuned for that. Um, let me know uh, what you, what your guys' thoughts are. Uh, the last product that um, we're developing is, uh, I think it's needed. Um, one of the things I would love to see you guys do is is attack your real estate business like an internet marketer. Um, that is a gap that. That that's something nobody's doing. And if you could do that, if you did do that, you would dominate. You would win every time. Now, at the base of Internet marketing is emails, mining your database with emails. And people know that, but uh, they don't do it. They're like, well, I don't know how to do it. I don't know what to say. Um, so we currently have about uh, a little under 100 done for you emails. Um, so I, I, you know, I want to have a product where you guys can literally just go, yep, I want to send out an email, cut, paste, boom, send it, um, and, uh, and get some deals. So I know guys, I, whether your email list is 10 or 10,000, there's deals in there. You just have to be talking with them. All right, that's it. Let me know what you think. Uh, I, uh, let's get to the episode. I hope you like it. Today on the show, I'm really, really excited to have today's guest. Now, when I booked this guest, I told you guys about it because uh, uh, I think it's going to be very instructive. Now, today's guest is Gary Nessner. He was in the FBI for 30 years as an investigator, instructor, and negotiator. Um, he's done everything from investigating Middle East hijackings, uh, long, long career. Gary, thanks for taking the time out today. Well, you're welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, you were the chief of the FBI Crisis Negotiation Unit, um, um, and you were the first person to hold that position. And what I want to find out from you and what my audience wants to hear about is, you know, we want to talk about how you take control of the situation, how to instantly build rapport. Um, but take a minute. Tell us, maybe just, you know, give us uh, uh, some background about yourself, Gary, uh, and, and, and some of the stuff that you were involved in. Well, I, I joined the FBI in 1972, and um, in, in 1980, I got my initial training in, in what was then a, a, a fairly new and rudimentary discipline, and that's also negotiation, something that really originated in New York City, and the FBI um, copied it very quickly and spread it around the, the country and the world. So, but in, in those days, it, it was fairly rudimentary, and um, I got into it as a, a side specialty in, the, in addition to doing my investigative work and my uh, Middle East terrorism uh, work, which was uh, also a new and emerging area back then. I uh, eventually uh, got involved in a number of uh, hostage and barricade incidents, working with local police and otherwise, and developed a skill set and uh, was asked to become a full-time FBI negotiator, uh, one of only two or three um, stationed at the FBI Academy in, in 1990. And then, um, you know, was involved in prison riots and uh, airplane hijackings, uh, overseas embassy takeovers, um, Waco, the Montana Freeman siege, the, uh, the public of Texas siege, several prison riots. And uh, eventually, after Waco, because of the issues that the FBI uh, confronted and, 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 and the mistakes that were identified, the separate standalone uh, the negotiation unit was created, the Crisis Negotiation Unit, and I was named the first head of that. And I did that, um, uh, you know, for the remainder of my career until I retired in, in 2003. Okay. So, so that's sort of my background. Yeah. I mean, prison riots to, to Waco. Um, I mean, and you, again, you were the first person to, 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 to hold this position. When it comes to when it comes to a negotiation, what are some of the some of the? I mean, let's start at the basics. What are some of the? Ba where should you start when you get for you? Um, whether it's a prison uh, a riot or or Waco, what are the some of the first steps that that people should think about? Well, I think uh, you know a hostage situation, a barricaded situation, a suicide situation, a whole range of types of incidents that that an FBI negotiator would respond to or a police negotiator are, are typically in, in over 90% of, of the cases driven by very high emotion. Okay. So 
it, it's it's not too hard to to uh, fathom that the the individual we're dealing with um, is acting uh, on anger, frustration, a sense of loss, feels underappreciated, unlistened to, been wronged, aggrieved, uh, desperate, suicidal, whatever. So we're dealing with those very very high emotions, and and of course our our, our, our knowledge and experience has shown us that when, when people are operating under that high emotional, um, you know, stimulus, that it, it's very challenging and unlikely for them to make good uh, decisions for both uh, their betterment and people that they may be holding. So the first thing that a negotiator, a uh, negotiation team actually is how we do it. The first thing we do is really to try to diffuse, uh, de-escalate. Um, when, Law enforcement shows up in an incident. People are are very defensive and assume law enforcement is is going to uh, try to hurt them or overpower them. So we have to present a different face. We have to present the face of uh, the caring, uh, honest, straightforward uh, police officer, negotiator from the FBI that wants to help them get out of this predicament. And and we know that this will uh, very often take some time. We have to develop uh, some rapport and. And create a relationship of trust, and and we do that by not lying to them and not manipulating them, and uh, being straightforward. And um, you know, it's the key to success. It sounds pretty simplistic, but it it's it's often quite harder to do than to say. So you know, this is this is interesting. I I, I do want to get into how to develop rapport and all that stuff, but but. I would think, I would think, um, Gary, you know, with law enforcement today, I mean, there's very much a, a militarization of law enforcement that's happening. These, these, you know, police officers are trained to use their guns, right? They're, you know, they're, they're, they get on the firing range, you know, they're, they, they run, you know, 2,000 rounds, whatever it is. Um, that's what they get trained with. So when they get into a situation like this, what, you know, everybody defaults back to training. Do you feel that if, if, there was more of a of a of a of a bent uh, or a focus on training police officers with your kind of training that that um situations um wouldn't you know whether it's a, a shooting or whatever i mean do you think that the you know where i'm getting with that. i'm not i'm not ending it correctly but you know where i'm getting at should should police officers well, have more training I, I, you know, first of all, I, I mean, police officers get a lot uh, more more training in a lot more areas than, than simply firearms. So okay. they uh, it depends on the department and where they get their training. But th- there are certainly um, uh, attempts across the country to teach police officers how to communicate with the citizens they serve and how to avoid uh, confrontations and escalation. Like any other human endeavor, there are some police officers who are a lot better at it than than others. But it is true that um, law enforcement um, officers typically are trained to resolve a situation that, that they, they are called out to very quickly and to move on into the next uh, problem that they have to face on their shift. So when people refuse to comply or they're behaving um, you know, against their own self-interest and against the interests of the community and law enforcement, there is a tendency among some in law enforcement to, to go for quickly to overpowering the person. And of course, we know that you know the more likely um, when we try to apply force, the more likely we are to be met with resistance. Mm. So there is a time and a place, and and it's a continuum of of interaction. But yes, I mean, I, I would accept your your underlying uh, thought that um, I think police in general would benefit from um, more enhanced, more expanded training in non you know in verbal communication skills there are nonverbal ones as well as verbal but certainly in in negotiation in dialogue to diffuse um situations um it's it's a tough it's a tough position we put police officers in and arming them uh, with with a more a complete set of tools to use is, is certainly uh, in everyone's benefit so, so again, as this applies to business, um, w- w- you know, w- you ended earlier. You said, "Hey, you know, you want to be caring. You want to, you want to be the person that that helps. Uh, you know, or, or, that the the person holding somebody hostage, right? You're there to help, and you don't let you're you're honest with them, right? You don't try to trick them. I, I, do you feel in in negotiations in business, right? Certainly, I want what I want. I want my terms for this particular contract." I, it, 
how can I use some of the training that 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 you have learned to help me negotiate a, a business contract to my to, to my benefit? Well, I think in the business world, all too often we're the hustle, bustle, rush, rush, rush. We want to get right down to business and close the deal. Yes, you want this. No, you don't want it. And in reality, when you look at successful salesmen and successful business leaders, um, the basis of that is 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 likability hmm. um, and and patience. Uh, you know, people um, will work with and want to work with people that they like. So we have to take the time to get to know somebody, to listen to them. Before I throw some offer on the table, if you or I are in the business negotiations, I, I need to say, you know, I, I have some thoughts, but I'd like to hear more about your business. Can you tell me, you know, mm. what sort of work you do, what sort of problems you face, and, and where you see your biggest needs? And, you know, once I better understand where you're coming from, then, then perhaps, you know, working with you, we can come up with some solutions. But if you pretend you know everything about someone and what, what they need or don't need, and you haven't invested the time, in learning about them, it's um, it's not very relationship enhancing. And, and the bottom line is relationships. Uh, relationships both get business and maintain uh, business. It's all about relationship. Okay. Yeah, I I completely agree. So so you know it's um, likability, right? You, you you need to be likable. And this goes points back to developing that rapport. Um, when you enter into a situation, right, you, you, there's high emotion sitting there, right? The, 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 the person feel, on the other side of the table or the fence, whatever, you know, they feel wronged, uh, is, is that, as you said earlier, what, what are some of the tips and tricks, not tricks is a bad word that, but what are some of the tips that you use to quickly develop rapport with, with that, that person? Well, I, I think you have to avoid arguing and attacking personally. Mm. And, uh, you know, if you, as a good negotiator, know that the person you're going to deal with is going to have some anxiety and some frustration and they're going to vent that at you, um, first and foremost, you want to uh, try to avoid responding in kind, which will not further your cause. So you have to be patient and listen and say, I, I appreciate it. I I hear that you're very frustrated with the way um, this has gone before and the lack of service that you feel you've gotten. And, um, you know, frankly, I, I want to hear more because we need to find a way to make sure that that doesn't happen in the future. So don't become overly defensive. Don't attack them. Just continue to say, you know, um, here, here's what I would like to try to do to help you. And uh, be open and forthcoming. Um, it's, it's the way to go. Uh, it's like when you walk in to buy a new car, you know, you get that slick salesman, he's got his hair slicked back. He's got a fancy suit. He says, Hey, I know exactly what you need today. And you want to say, well, you have no idea what I need. You don't know me. You haven't talked to me. You haven't listened to me. I like the laid back salesman that says, Hey, you know, folks, I see you're in the showroom looking for a car today. Um, you probably don't want anybody bugging you. I'll be over there at my desk. If you got any questions, I'm glad to help you. But, uh, you know, I think we would like to uh, like to give you the time to, to look around and, and come up with any questions, and we're here if you need us. Mm. That's the guy I'm going to. I'm not going to Mr. Slick, you know, who's all over you, following you around the showroom, bugging you, asking you questions. You know, um, it's just phony. Uh, some people fall prey to that, but, um, you know, you want that likable, sincere, genuine person that you feel like if um, I can do business with this person, then they're they're not going to screw me over. Sure, and I think that I think that speaks to the thing that you said earlier, right? You got to have patience, right? But but so um, in that in that situation, I I would agree with what you said, Gary. But in that situation, me as the salesperson, I'm not moving the ball forward. I'm just letting that person. I'm I'm letting it happen organically or not. Um, there's how how would I move the ball forward towards uh, you know either this person saying a yes to buying a car or no buying a car right I mean is is do you believe in all situations or or all situations like that that you should just let it happen organically and let the chips fall where they do or you know are there are there tools or strategies that you know to to be able to again move that ball forward towards the finish line that you want you desire well there's a thousand business books and they talk about the rule of press of reciprocity. You know, I do things for you. You yeah. do things for me. They talk about likability. They talk about social proof. There's a, there's any number of business theories and I, I don't want to get into that too much, but, 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 but I can tell you that 
successful uh, salesmen that I've seen, and I've worked also you know, since I retired in, in, in the private sector, and when the company I work for is selling a, a service to a client, um, I feel as though that business was gained because of the way I interacted with the client, and the business will be kept because when the client has a problem or issue, they know they can call me, and I will follow through and make sure it gets taken care of. If the client senses that I was just in this to sell them something and then I don't care about the problem later on, I'm going to lose that business. So, uh, you know, you just have to, I think you have to be, be genuine and, and, and try to uh, listen to what the client is saying, listen to what their concerns are, listen to what their needs are, um, and, and try to, to address those as best you can. Don't be in a rush. And, uh, you know, the harder you try to, to close that deal quickly, probably the more resistance you're going to get. Okay. And again, I would agree with that. So, so what about in terms of, you know, that reciprocity or something, right? So I have to, you know, if I'm, uh, you know, I'm looking at your website, right? You, you, right now you've dealt with prison riots, you, you know, right wing militia standoffs, religious zealots, all these people want something. So, so how do you, you know, is there a, um, how do you get someone, if somebody's in a hostage situation, how do you, um, your, your book, hold on, let's, let me take a, let me step back and let the audience know. So Gary Nesner wrote a book, it's called Stalling for Time, My Life as an FBI Hostage Negotiator. Now, why did you title your book Stalling for Time? Well, uh, and, and it goes to your, your lead-up question before that, because what's more important is, is not to be in a rush, to slow things down. You know, the, the old saying that time heals all wounds, but time allows us to lower our emotions and make better, more thoughtful decisions. You know, when you show up to a desperate guy that's thinking of killing his girlfriend because she's told him she's leaving him, you know, you show up and say, you know, Mr. Smith, 90% of these come out okay. The guy puts his gun down, so quit being a horse's ass and come on out now. <laughs> yeah. You know, that may be true, and <laughs> it may be good advice, but that person's not only not ready to take that advice, but you haven't earned the right to your uh, attempts to build a relationship to be of any influence to this person at all. Good negotiations is a process. We have to listen. We have to learn. We have to show empathy, understanding. Um, we do that by paraphrasing what they said, repeating what they said. Mm. Um, and eventually we build a rapport, and after we have a rapport, we gain the cooperation. Whether that's cooperation for them not to hurt somebody that they're holding or hurt themselves, or cooperation to buy a product that I want them to buy, or to enter into an agreement that, that is, I think, beneficial to both of us. So, so time alone... Uh, slowing it down in most situations, not every single one, but in most situations, is a valuable commodity that is is underappreciated and underused. Okay, so time alone is a commodity. Now, um, what about the fact that, so, I mean, let, let's say, that, again, I want something, you want something, right? So I'm, a, I'm holding somebody hostage and I, I'm, I make some kind of demand, a million dollars and a helicopter, I don't know what it is. Um, what sorts of things would you give and and then take back? Wait, here's a here's a real life example for for my aunts, right? They they sell real estate. Somebody says, "Hey, I'll give you five hundred thousand. We're, we're offering five hundred thousand dollars, and I want you to leave the fridge and the and the uh, and the washing machine, right?" Um, and somebody says, well, hold on. No, I won't. I will. I'll take, you know, uh, if you want that stuff, you got to add three grand. Like, I guess what I'm trying to get at, and I'm not, I'm not doing a good job of asking this question, but you know, in terms of like offering something in exchange for, and then taking something back, I, I have to assume that you use this all the time. Well, you can, but you, you also have to understand that, um, and I'll come back to your business okay. example in sure. a second, but in law enforcement, you know, we're basically offering a pretty rudimentary choice uh, in, in, in many of these cases. It's eventually cooperate <laughs> and, and be a nice guy or, or run the risk of being killed by us because you're resisting and threatening someone's life. So at the end of the day, we're fortunate in that most human beings want to live more than they want to die. But we, we can't come up and say, hey, bad guy, I'm here now, I'm a negotiator. Give up or we're going to kill you. I mean, that, that is not rapport building and that is not helpful. So we have to get to that place slowly and surely in a business, a real estate negotiations. I mean, I think you have to, it's not so much what you say, it's how you say it, mm. your tone and your demeanor. You say, okay, you're, you're, you know, um, we've, we've talked about the price point here. 
And uh, now at this stage, you, you've talked about some additional things you'd like uh, in there. And, um, you know, if you feel like that's beyond what you can do, you say, you know, well, I, I can maybe meet you halfway on some of that. But in order for me to leave those items, because I had planned on taking those to my next residence or the client wants to take those, that's a very high-end stove or whatever, you know, we can do that, but then we're going to have to stay up a little higher on the price point. You know, you don't say, oh, you're crazy, you're asking for too much. You know, it's how you say it, and you explain why that may be a problem to do it just the way they want, and you appeal to them, um, you know, to consider another option. You know, you're going to get, in a business transaction, a real estate transaction, as you know, you're going to get some people to walk away. They're going to say, well, it's a buyer's market, screw them, I'll go somewhere else. Well, that's fine. That may happen regardless, but you just don't want to drive them away because they say, you know, I just don't like working with that person. I don't like that real estate agent. I don't like that seller. They're, they're, uh, I don't like their attitude. They're you know, uncompromising. Um, so you, you can alleviate a good, good many of the problems by the right tone and demeanor in which you discuss the particulars. There will always be differences in point of view about what something is worth or what they should or should not get. But if you take your time and you're patient, you'll, you'll settle into more often than not something that's acceptable for both parties. Okay. I mean, again, this goes back to patience and, and, and uh, you know, taking the, the emotion out of it. So let me, let me ask you this, Gary. So, you know, you said it's, it's, you know, it's, how, it's how you say it. It's your tone. It's your demeanor. Now, what we know yeah. – I'm, I'm sorry, Gary. What did you say? I, I was agreeing with you. Oh, got it. Okay. Yes. So, so, but as we know, you know, words are, are are one thing, but but in communication, right? Your body language is much more important than what you say, um, um, and I, I, I'm I'm sure you would agree with that. In terms of negotiating for you uh, and and what you've done for the last three decades, as well as somebody negotiating a deal, is it better to hold that sort of negotiation or t- or talk about those points in person? Is is and I guess what I'm I, what's your your thoughts on body language outside of tone and and demeanor? And I guess I guess demeanor is part of that. Yeah. So outside of tone and words, yeah, the bo- the body you know from my my law enforcement experience, the body language issue is a bit challenging in that we don't sit down with somebody who's holding a gun yeah. on us or someone else. So there's the, there's the safety factor that um, forces us to primarily concentrate on, on the verbal interaction from, from a safety of a telephone. Now, in a real estate transaction or another kind of transaction, yeah, I'm, I mean, I think if it's, if it's a fairly complex and difficult issue, if you have the opportunity to sit down with the client, uh, I think it's 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 much better. It's harder to argue with somebody face to face than it is over the phone. Mm. So what you do is you you block in disruptions. You know, if if someone comes into your office, you hold your phone calls. You you turn you know, put your cell phone away and you come out from behind the desk and you sit out there with them and you know you just you you, you make it uh, more focused on the client. You don't treat the client like they're just one of another 20 people is going to come through your office this week. And, you know, it's no big deal. Um, people want to be appreciated. They want to be listened to and taken seriously and have their concerns addressed. Uh, you don't always have to be able to give them a firm answer right away. You don't always have to be able to resolve their problems. But you do have to listen to them and acknowledge mm. them. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, I, you know I, I hear you've got some, some real issues with this particular property and, and and um, you're not sure if this is going to fall within your budget. And I can certainly understand that. And it seems like you got an awful lot to think about. But you know, if you think we can make this work some way, and there's something I can do to help this, let's let's work together and see if we can do that before we abandon this this effort to get this property. I mean, I, I think you know, I think you will find uh, probably there's your most successful <laughs> realtors or salesmen probably do a lot of these things intuitively without really putting a label on it or, or yeah. even doing it purposely. But it's, you know, the folks that try to do the high pressure stuff um, and the manipulative stuff, you know, it's the old saying, you can, you can get away with that with a lot of folks, but at the end of the day, uh, I think you're going to come across in a way that, that's not going to enhance your, your productivity and your, your sales uh, numbers. 
Right. And I, you know, it's funny, I'm reading your, I'm reading as you're talking, I'm reading your, uh, I'm reading some of the reviews of your book and, and, and you know, I'm, I'm seeing kind of over and over again, you know, uh, the, the, the notion of how to stay cool under fire. So let's, let's talk about, let's talk about, uh, again, some of the, some of the specifics in your work. Um, I'm sure you've seen the Taken franchise with Liam Neeson, right? How, how, I mean, is that just complete fiction or how, how close to that um, uh, reality is that actually? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll disappoint you because I haven't seen that movie. I, I tend not to watch that stuff because there's always a snippet or two that, that are creative and maybe even rudimentary, on a rudimentary level, replicate reality. But by and large, they're, they're mostly nonsense. And, um, you know, it's just not the way it works. When, when we're negotiating, we're negotiating as a team. So I may be the person on the phone, phone with you while you're holding your employer hostage because he's fired you. But I've got three or four people helping me assess what you're saying and helping me come up with ideas, passing me notes, and so forth. And so on. that's how we do it long for them. We, we use our combined strength, knowledge, and experiences. You know, we, we avoid um, doing anything that's going to make you more educated and more angry. Um, you know, we're eventually going to get you to... Um, people act out because they don't feel like they're being listened to. They're not taken seriously. People have not respected me. We're going to do all those things. And, and if you can apply that to life in general, whether you're having a problem with your teenagers, mm-hmm. with your neighbor, uh, your spouse, you know, and, and, you know, and it's tough for all of us at home, you know, um, you know, but we have to get in the habit of saying, okay, you know, we've got an issue here. I, you've got my undivided attention. Let me hear what it is that I'm doing that's creating a problem. And, Let's work out together how we might be able to, uh, or how I can, <laughs> I can change this situation because, uh, you know, our relationship's important. I, 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 you know, you have to recognize when you've made mistakes and, and go up to them and, and move forward. And I think people appreciate that. If you're always getting upset over minor things and you're being overly defensive and you attack people and attack them personally, not on the facts, but on their personality or, or their way of thinking, it's, it's just not conducive to success. No, yeah, I agree. So, how do we, in, in terms of some of the stuff that, that that again you've done for the last three decades, how can we use some? If you know, we've we talked about it in a business sense, but what about in a personal sense? What if you know, let's 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 come up with. Uh, here's what I'm getting at: people don't always know what they want. So you can ask, you can have a cool head, you can have a great tone, demeanor, the right words. But if I ask you what what's wrong with you, what's wrong with the situation, or you know, why are you upset? Um, you know, they may not give me the, the, the true answer. What are some of the things if, if someone out there has a teenage daughter, you know, like, Hey, what's, what's wrong? Nothing, nothing, nothing. You know, what are, what are some of the strategies people can use to really uncover the real truth from someone? Yeah. Sometimes you have to have what we call a one way dialogue, you know, and you have to probe a little bit. You say, you know, well, you know, I, 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 I can sure tell you're upset and now I don't fully understand uh, the problem because you haven't shared it with me, but would it help if I did this? Or what do you think if we did the following? You know, you, you ask an open-ended question. You don't ask a question where they're just going to nod their head and say yes or no. You kind of force them to provide you with some, uh, you know, acquiescence to what you're suggesting and to, to buy in. And once they've bought into it, then hopefully they'll be as committed as you are. You know, so, I mean, there are some tough nuts to crack that you know, I'm, I'm not suggesting this this is easy, and talking with teenagers in the best of circumstances is, is a challenge. But, but <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think you have to try, and you have to give them an opportunity on the time level that they're willing to do it to uh, to invest the time and, and giving them a chance and in an atmosphere to feel comfortable enough to share with you what's bothering them, what's on their mind. It may not come out right away. You know, business people would come right up and say, okay, I know there's a problem. I can tell you're angry. What is it? Boom, boom. And, you know, we hear it. We come up with a solution and off we go. Well, kids, it's not going to be that way, you know. You may have to really gently probe about to find out why they've been misbehaving in school. Maybe they're being bullied. And maybe there's a, a teacher that they just have a lot of problem with or a class. And, you know, don't, don't expect to get the answer right away. You know, you, you have to some time and it may take a number of uh, initiatives on your part to, to accomplish the goal. 
Got it. Yeah, I think this goes back. This all you know, patience and 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 having the right demeanor. So we're gonna start wrapping up here, Gary. Um, what I'm gonna ask you a kind of a crazy question. See, because again, you have a you have this very very unique uh, and 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 rich background. Um, what's something? This is a crazy question. What what's something I should have asked you, but I didn't ask you? <laughs> yes. Boy, that, boy, that that's that's a good one. Um, you know, uh, we've covered an awful lot of territory. I think the um, maybe it's not so much a question you didn't ask, but maybe something I I should have mentioned that I didn't. Yeah. And I think when you think about success in negotiations in life or business or law enforcement, the number one thing to keep in mind is self control. Um, if I cannot control my own emotions, and I'm not saying emotion is always an evil, but I'm saying high emotion tends to thwart our ability to think and assess and make good decisions. So getting back to self-control, if I am unable to control my own high emotions, how can I expect to be able to influence you? Mm -hmm. So when we go into an argument, we go into a sales meeting, we go into a high-end interaction of any kind, if I'm not comfortable with my emotional state, um, then I probably shouldn't be uh, pursuing the discussion right now. It's part of the reason people walk walk away saying, you know, we're really angry, let's, let's bring this up again tomorrow. That's normally a good thing to do. It doesn't mean you failed, it's just we now have both worked ourselves up into such a state of... Uh, of controversy and confrontation that it, it's hard to draw back. Now let's sit down again tomorrow and revisit these issues when we both had a time to think about it and we both had time to cool off. So I okay. think self-control is, is, is one of the guiding principles in all of this. And and so this is a good time to, to ask for a, for a book recommendation. Is there in terms of if you know developing that self-control or developing some of the um, – skills that you have, Gary, other than your book, and we'll, we'll, we'll pitch your book in a second. You know, what is a good book that you could recommend uh, for someone? Well, on this topic, I really like uh, Dr. Robert Cialdini's uh, Influence, The Art of Persuasion. I think it's a really, really fine book for people and, and has, obviously, implications that, that aren't law enforcement focused, but rather more for the business person. Um, I think... Um, I think those are, are very good. Uh, there's another book in which I was honored to be one of the people profiled called The, the Art of Doing uh, by Camille Sweeney and Josh Goshfield. And they, they profile uh, some, some very successful people in life in various walks of life. And they digest what it was about them, um, how they conduct themselves and how they interact with others and how that has led them to be successful. So those are, those are two really good books, I think, that would... Uh, benefit people got it and for everybody out there if you haven't read the art of doing and by the way i'm going to get this i'm going to get uh um the the psychology of persuasion so for everybody if you haven't read the psychology of persuasion by uh robert caldini go get it get a copy on us just use our link audibletrial.com slash super agents live and uh, and let me know what you think hey so gary I would encourage everybody to go get your book. Um, I'm reading the the, the uh, book reviews, and it sounds sounds like somebody should turn this into a movie. I haven't, but a gripping storyteller. Uh, this guy's got stories. It's uh, everybody seems to love your book. So everybody, go get Gary Nesner's book, "Stalling for Time: My Life as a FBI Hostage Negotiator." Now, I I do encourage my audience, Gary, to reach out and say thank you to you for taking the time out, if they've gotten any nuggets out of this. So where can people find you? Yeah, I have a website, uh, www.garynestor.com, and there's uh, contact information on that. And uh, yeah, send, if they want to send a message, I'll, I'll certainly get it through that site. And uh, always nice hearing from people, and I hope those who decide to order and read the book will, will enjoy it. It's available on Kindle, of course, and uh, um, I hope that... Um, the lessons learned from, from my law enforcement challenges, which were certainly at the high end of things, uh, if, if, if we can be successful in that context, uh, then certainly the skill sets we talk about uh, in the book can, can help someone in, in more, or I should say, less life-threatening incidences in life.
Awesome. And listen, everybody out there, um, if, you know, if you're riding your bike, driving your car, whatever, I'll have all this stuff, links to Gary's book, links to his site on our, on our website at superagentslive.com. Hey, Gary, I'll be the first one to kick off the thank you train. Thanks, man. I know you're a busy guy. Um, you still do kidnap, uh, kidnap investigations, uh, kidnap management. Um, so I appreciate you taking the time out. Uh, my pleasure, John. Yes. Toby. <laughs> nice to chat with you. <laughs> okay, talk yeah, to you Toby, soon. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, that was my last interview. Yeah, thank you. All right, buddy. Talk to you soon. Let's go.